2 Corinthians, the chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3, like Eric mentioned, we'll have communion tonight and we'll uh, study chapter 3 of Second Corinthians um, verse by verse, but this morning we're going to look at the end of the chapter. If you were here on Wednesday night, we already covered the first part of the chapter, so tonight's Bible study will be a review for some of you guys, but uh, it's a great chapter. Couldn't uh, spend too much time here, I don't think. So we'll start reading in uh, verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Father, we thank you for revealing your glory to us, and we know God our human nature, there's a longing in us to find glory, to have it, and to participate in it, to have it for ourselves. And Lord, I thank you that you've created us for glory, and that there is within us a desire for glory, and a desire for greatness. And thank you, Lord, that you have set us free from the world's definition of glory. It's just so fading and so faulty. And Lord, you've, in your own uh, word and in your own life, Jesus, when you were here, you've, you've shown us what true greatness is and you've, you've shown us the way to glory, real glory, uh, a weight of glory that lasts the ages, that when heaven and earth pass away, there's a glory that will never pass away. And so we, we thank you for that, Lord. We pray you'd open up our hearts and our minds that we would be able to receive from your spirit this morning the the encouragement and the strength that we so desperately need to be able to go forward in this life and to overcome, Lord. We thank you that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. So give us that power to be more than conquerors and show us your ways, Lord. We, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's an interesting uh, passage of scripture to fall on on the first Sunday of a new year when uh, so many people have I've made uh, New Year's resolutions, and I sort of had a different strategy this year because usually if I make a resolution, I don't keep it, so this year I made a resolution to gain weight. <laughs> Since I never usually keep my resolutions, I figured I was going to do a little reverse resolution psychology on myself. <laughs> I'm only going to eat junk food and gain weight this coming year. See, you see my wisdom there? So if I only break them, then I'm losing weight and I won't eat junk food. Do you think it's going to work? You guys know me. No, it's pretty much. No, no, no. It's not going to work. Um, many people, and, and we, we understand, and it's something that, that's, that's kind of a universal, a desire to be able to make change, to look at your life and say, but I really wish this was different. And the problem is, is that we almost never are able to go beyond the wishing that something was different. We wish it was different, and then it never becomes different, and the only way that I know that a person can experience real change is by the Holy Spirit. You can, you can make some changes to your life, and if you, maybe you have made resolutions or maybe you've, you've overcome a, a, a significant challenge that was in your life through you know, determination and, and support and, and commitment and a different plan or something, and, and you know, congratulations to you. Um, but even those changes are, are only ultimately superficial because uh, old age catches up with all of us and, um, you know, the weakness of our body catches up with all of us. And the only way to make a real lasting change that I know of is, is by the Spirit. And it's by a work of Jesus. It's something that only God could do. And I think that in the world, people look at the new year and it's something to celebrate and uh, to be so excited about. It. And it's because there's a longing in human hearts to to find real change, and then, you know, if you, if you understand Jesus and you, and you think, man, how many, how many disappointments are there in the next month? All the gym memberships that have been purchased and all the people that got their new gym clothes, and they'll be at the gym for three weeks, if that long, you know, there's that, that desire, you know, that's there to make a change, but how hard it is to follow through and have the change actually be lasting, and this particular verse that we're in talks about a real change. In fact, he uses a word 
uh, that uh, we have as part of our, our vocabulary. It's the word metamorphosis. It's from the Greek word morphe, which means form and essence. And the idea is the change of a form, the change of an, eff- an, uh, uh, an essence. So the caterpillar spins the cocoon and you know, goes into its sleep or whatever and, and emerges as a butterfly. And we say, that's a, now that's a change right there. That's a metamorphosis. And God has put these kind of changes in the natural world so that we would see them and it would sort of kindle in our thinking, this is what can happen for us. God has made sermons all over the natural world for us to read if we would open that book with an open mind. The, the idea that there is a real change. And in this verse, verse 18 in particular, with an unveiled face we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And then he says, we're being transformed into that same image. A real change that would take place in our lives. And it, thankfully, the Bible doesn't leave it a secret as to how you can experience this kind of a change. Now, if you came to me before the sermon and you said, hey, I, I made this uh, you know, New Year's resolution, I'm going to lose this many pounds, or I'm gonna, I want to learn this foreign language, or you know, I, I'm going to you know, not mark 10 things off my bucket list, or you know, whatever you were going to try to do, and you're like, what are, what are some things I could do? It's like, well, how's your willpower? Well, I don't have any willpower. Okay, well, how good are you at making you know, hard decisions? I'm terrible at making hard decisions. Okay, well, none of them are going to come true. You know, there's a certain amount of the changes that we want to have happen in our life, and they're directly traced back to our ability to make sacrifices, to... Um, to choose something above something. This is an easy thing to choose for me. This is a difficult thing to choose for me. And for my own life, the chances that I'm going to choose the difficult thing above the easy thing are, are slim. I'm going to almost always choose the easy way. But this verse shows us and tells us how to experience this transformation. In fact, he says we, we are being transformed. The idea is that this is happening. This isn't a hope that's for a select few. This is something that's a universal reality for anybody who would put into practice what Paul's talking about in this section. We probably should have read earlier, um, if you'll jump up into verse 12, so that you'll see when he's talking about this veil, what does he mean with unveiled face? Because in the context, verse 12, he says, therefore, we have this hope, we use great boldness of speech, and now he makes a contrast with something in Israel's history, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. And their minds were blinded. He's going to make it into a, a, an illustration of this reality. Moses, remember when he was up on the mountain and he received the law of God and God revealed his glory to him. And then Moses, when he came down from the mountain, his face was radiating. And so the people were preoccupied with the shining of his face and not really with what God had said. And so they're not really sure in the, in the Old Testament story. It looks like Moses was putting a veil over his face just because of the distraction that it was for the people and their fears. Here, Paul says, it's because it was fading. And uh, this veiling of the glory, Moses had been affected by the glory. He put a veil over it because the people really couldn't receive that glory. And so Paul then says, look, their minds were blinded. That glory that God was wanting to have revealed to the nation of Israel, they were not in a position to be able to receive that glory. They weren't in a, in a uh, covenant that would allow them to receive it. But he says uh, in verse 14, continuing, uh, and until today the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. So even if they're still looking at the word of God and the Old Covenant, they still can't see that glory. It's veiled to them. Verse 15, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. However, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So that's the illustration that he's building is, apart from Jesus Christ, the glory is veiled. But then when you turn to Christ, that veil is taken away. There's nothing to restrain you from experiencing the glory of God. Whatever hindrances they had, even they, they, part, they parted the Red Sea, they saw all these plagues come upon the nation of Egypt. They, they saw the mountain on fire. They had the tablets of stone written with the finger of God, yet there was a veil. But when you turn to the Lord, anything that was there is now gone. It's open. So he says, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so we, verse 18, but we all with an unveiled face 
beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. So Israel was veiled. They had a revelation of God, but it was not a revelation of God that was going to allow them to share completely in the glory of God. It was going to be veiled. They didn't have the access to God that they would have in the New Covenant. They didn't have the relationship with God that they would have in the New Covenant. And so there was, a, there was something there still hindering. But when you turn to the Lord, anything that would be there between a person and having a relationship with God is now taken away. So you don't need a priest, you don't need a church, you don't need me. You don't, you just, if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you can then behold. Now it's not perfectly as one day it will be, so he says like in a mirror. It's not, it, then face to face, but right now, but, we, but there is no veil in the sense that there's nothing that would hinder you from receiving all from God that he wants to give to you. We're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and so that transformation happens. We're transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So there's nothing that can keep us from seeing Jesus. There's nothing that can keep us from knowing Jesus. And there's nothing that can keep us from experiencing Jesus. So that when you turn to the Lord, you're turning to a person. You're not turning to a system. You're not turning to a form or rituals. You're not turning to a structure. You're turning to a person. And when you turn to that person, there's nothing between you and that person from you to be able to experience him. Now, for Israel, there was a veil there. When Moses came down, they were like, put a veil over your face of glory. And they, they were unsure. They were afraid. They'd already sinned and broken the Ten Commandments. And, and then Moses is coming down again. That's when the veil was over his face. They'd, they'd already failed. And there was this awareness that God's glory was something they couldn't share in. But in now, in Jesus Christ, the glory of God is something that can be received. It's something that can be experienced. So that as a Christian, your experience is meant to be with God himself and with his glory. I hope that your experience of worship isn't only what you experience in this room. Because this isn't all that there is. This is 20 minutes or 30 minutes of your week. That's a small fraction of your time. I hope that you're able to experience worship throughout the week. I hope that you have done some investigation and found some music style that you like that's worshipful and, and songs that resonate with you and the words resonate with you and that you have them and that they're part of your experience throughout your week so that you're in a state of worship and experiencing the presence of the Lord all week long and recognizing Him. I hope that your time in the Word isn't, the only, isn't this morning only. That the only time you're in the Bible is the 45 minutes or 50 minutes that you come to Calvary Chapel. And that this is the time that you hear from God. Now, we hope that when you come here, you hear from God. Believe me. That's what we pray for. That's what we're trying to do. That's why we're trying to teach the Bible systematically so that you'll actually learn the Bible. But the goal would be that your appetite would be stirred up so that you would want to have an experience with God from His Word every single day. That you'd want to have that. You'd want to hear from him. You'd want to know his voice. We'd hope that when you pray, it wouldn't just be, Lord, thank you for this food and thank you that you know, no one in my family is sick. And those are great things. I'm thankful for food and I'm thankful when no one's sick. Those are, that's wonderful prayer. But we hope that your prayer would go beyond just asking God for things when you're in trouble and you'd enter into prayer where you're actually in a relationship with God. And this idea of no veil, nothing to keep us from knowing and experiencing Jesus. If you came to church today and you were feeling guilty because of sin that's in your life and decisions that you've made and things that you've done and you thought, man, I really need to go to church, I really want to go to church, but man, I don't, you know, I've just really blown it. Going through the holidays and I was with these people and I did this and I was here and I did that and ugh. Oh, you got shame and you've got guilt. Well, listen, the veil is taken away. Jesus Christ has taken away the guilt and the penalty for sin by dying on the cross for our sins. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have enough guilt to say, oh God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. A guilt that would lead you to repentance, a guilt that would lead to confession, that's a fine kind of a conviction of sin. But don't have a guilt that says you can't come. Have a guilt that lets you come and say, be guilty enough to say, I've got to come to Jesus so I can get cleansed. I need to come to Jesus, my high priest, and come to his sacrifice and receive his touch and, and cry out to him for help. 
I need, I need Jesus in my life. Don't have a guilt, though, that would say you're too guilty to come. Or don't let shame and be ashamed over your sin and let shame create a barrier because the veil is taken away in Christ. With an unveiled face, we behold the glory of the Lord. God wants us to be able to approach him. His his throne is a throne of grace. It's approachable. There's no guilt and shame anymore because it's been taken away. And And the approach to God is an approach that now is wide open. And Hebrews, it says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, that's not a boldness of pride. That's a boldness knowing that, hey, it's open. There's no timidity there. This door is open. Jesus said, if anyone wants to come to me, then come. So if you're here and you know, man, of all the people in this room, I'm the one probably who needs the forgiveness the most. Well, then you let that be boldness. Then come. Come and receive from Jesus. Come and realize the veil is taken away. If you want to experience real change, the only way that you're going to experience it is by approaching Jesus. The only way to experience real change is by drawing near to him and coming into his presence and and beholding his glory. It's interesting to me that Paul uses this idea of glory and repeats it in this section. He talks about the glory that Moses had that was fading away. He mentions that this new ministry of the new covenant is much more glorious and then he, in our passage, is talking about this glory, beholding the glory. What an interesting way to describe your relationship with God, beholding the glory. So as you, are, as you as a Christian and your relationship with the Lord, to what extent do you behold the glory of the Lord? Because probably you could say almost to that extent is how much you're experiencing the power of God or the, the change of God and transformation of God in your life. Beholding the glory of the Lord. How do you do that? Is this even possible? Is it, what would be the practical application here? I mean, it's, verse 18 is a powerfully religious-sounding verse. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. You could read that verse and say, that's a cool verse, but what in the world does it mean? Transformed, beholding, veil, what is all this stuff? Is it possible Well, absolutely. Paul's describing what it means to abide in Jesus. That would be another way of putting it. Jesus talked about a branch unable to bear fruit unless it was abiding in a vine, as in literally remaining. That's what the word abide means, to remain connected. If a vine's connected to the branch, then you're pretty sure that in the season, as the, as the time comes, that that branch will begin to bear fruit by virtue of its relationship, its connection to the vine. So Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. You can't bear fruit of yourself unless you're abiding in me. But if you're abiding in me, you're going to bear much fruit. That's one analogy. Paul is describing the same experience here, but he uses a totally different illustration. He says, like Moses was veiled, a veil that was passing away, a veil that signified their inability to experience the glory of the Lord under the old covenant, because all they could do is point out their sin. Now in the new covenant, God's taken away our sin, and the veil's taken away, and now we can actually see the glory of God. And so we all, with with a face that's free, we behold the glory of the Lord. So when you come to church, and you think of the singing time, what does it mean to you to come and spend time singing to the Lord? Are you uncomfortable about your voice? Are you uncomfortable and nervous about the songs? Do you think, oh man, I I like the Bible study, I can listen to it, but the singing part makes me feel strange and uncomfortable. Well, think of it like this. Think of it like you came to behold the glory of the Lord. Determine that I'm going to get there and I'm going to open my eyes with an unveiled face and I'm going to behold the glory of the Lord in the song. A song about how God's my father, and I'm going to behold how glorious it is that I'm his child and he's my father. And what it means that God's adopted me and that he cares about me, and I'm going to behold that glory. I'm going to look at it unveiled. I'm going to let my heart open up, and with the eyes of my heart, I'm going to focus on the reality of who God is. A song about his transcendent nature, his power, and I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to behold the glory of God in the song as I'm singing it. Now, you might be next to me saying, man, I hope the pastor gets vocal lessons or something. You're hearing what you're hearing, but you don't know exactly what I'm hearing. I'm worshiping. 
I want to worship the Lord. Beholding the glory of the Lord. When you read your Bible, maybe you've had the experience that I've had. I remember when I was a new Christian and, uh, you know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses came to my door and they knew the Bible so much better than I did. And I was so determined. I mean, the next time that somebody came to my front door with all their answers and all their questions and I was such a novice and I couldn't answer and I thought, man, I'm determined to know answers to be able to share with these guys you know, of course, win, you know, the argument. I mean, because I was so spiritual, you know, had grown to such maturity. You know, and then a lot of energy gets spent studying and learning facts and thinking, well, they think this and we think that and their verse says this and this is how they twist it and this is what the Bible really says. And, and reading the Bible to gain information. How about reading the Bible to behold the glory of the Lord? The veil's taken away. To go to the word of God and say, Lord, I've got your word, and now because you've given it to me, I can, without any separation, I can experience Jesus through his living word. What an amazing thought to seek the Lord, to to actually pursue him, to say, you know, what my life is about is I want to know God. And whatever's first has been first is now second or third or some other order down the list, the number one thing is I'm going to seek God. I'm going to seek his glory. I'm going to seek to know him. And thankfully, the Bible tells us that this is something that's possible. It's something that is available to us. If you seek the Lord, the Bible says you'll find him. If you seek the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, guess what? Well, a rainbow is something that is, you know, it's an angle of these electromagnetic radiation waves that's relative to your position. You see the light is hitting the, the, the water that's in the atmosphere and it's bending and refracting and then it comes to you and it's based upon your angle. So you change your angle and the thing's always moving. So you're never going to get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There's no such thing as leprechauns. They don't hide their gold at the, at the end of the rainbow and you're not going to find it. You could search forever, but the nature of the thing means that you'll never get to the end of the rainbow. It's not, it's not something that's physically existing. It's something that can only be seen relative to your position between the angle of the light. It's not even there. It's not even physical. You see it, but it's not actually there. But when we say seek the Lord, guess what? God's there. You'll find him. God said, if you seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. A wholehearted desire after God will always lead to a revelation of God. Isn't that amazing to think about? A wholehearted purchasing of lottery tickets will not necessarily lead to the winning of the lottery. A wholehearted desire of an Iowa Buckeye fan watching his team play in the Rose Bowl will not lead to an Iowa victory. <laughs> My daughter goes to Stanford. She was at the game. I was pretty happy for her. I texted her. I was like, you got to be enjoying this game. You even have a voice left, you know. You know, you could, you could be longing for something to happen. How many things in this life that you long for, and it's just really, you know, you kinda, you're just kind of flipping a coin, or you're just throwing the things up in the air, and we'll just see where they land. Let me tell you something. A wholehearted searching after God, guess what? You find God. (laughs) It never fails that if you seek God with all your heart, he'll reveal himself to you. If you came to church today and you're here and you're, you're in one of those places in your life where you need direction, trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your ways. He will direct your paths. You need the wisdom of God. Surrender yourself to God and seek him and trust him. Don't rely on your understanding. He'll make your way clear. 100%. He'll never fail. It won't be your biography as, I'm the one guy God failed. You know, I'm the one woman God let down. God never answered my prayer. I sought him. He just never revealed himself to me. I was in trouble. He didn't come through. I needed direction. Yeah, he left me lost. Lost girl to my biography. God failed me. That'll never happen. God will always reveal himself. Seeking the Lord is something that the Bible continually exhorts us to and then shows us how to do it. We seek the Lord through his word, which is why as a church we're so devoted, religiously devoted, to studying the word of God. 
We're going through it. We're going to not leave a verse out. We're going to start at the front and we're going to go to the back and we're done. We're going to start over because we didn't really get it the first time or the second time or now the third time. We're not, you know, we're like in first grade, we're repeating. We're just going to keep doing it until the Lord comes for us because we know that God reveals himself through his word. So what we're committed to doing as a fellowship is we want to behold the glory of the Lord. So we're going to take time in music and seek God in songs and behold the glory of the Lord. Then we're going to take his word and we're going to behold the glory of the Lord. Seeking God from his word. So how do you do that? Number one, you read the Bible. Now I've met a lot of people that say, well, I read the Bible. And as soon as they say it, I just think, nah, you know, like whenever you could hear the tone, I read the Bible. Like, really? You did? I could tell by your tone. You must have really read it with an open heart. Man, you read, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Get into the Word of God. Decide, I'm going to read the Bible every day. Make it part of your commitment to the Lord, to seeking Him, to behold His glory. Say, Lord, I'm going to read your Word every single day. And don't do it haphazardly. You'll find it's much more rewarding and it'll be much more successful to you if you don't just go well man i'm in trouble i just really like the psalms and i'm just going to read the psalms that's fine that can be fine for a season but you want to you want to pick books of the bible and you want to read and learn it and go through that book like start and read and, and wherever you stop reading that day pick up the next day and read read systematically now i also would tell you if you're new to reading the bible and you get to a part of the bible that you don't understand read that part of the bible through until you find something in it that you do understand. Now that might mean that if it's a whole list of names, maybe eight chapters of names, and none of the names are meaningful to you, then that day you're like a Bible reading champion. You just, you're like names, 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 and like, man, I am cooking today. Names, names. I've read, I've already read four chapters that fast. Read through those and say, okay, it's a list of names, more names. These people are being named they're part of something. I don't really get this. And read, but you know what? You'll find something that you do understand. It won't take long until that sharp two-edged sword starts to pierce, and you'll say, oh, there it is. There's that sharp knife. All right, I, I understand this part. That relates to me. Read till you understand something. Read to seek the Lord. Read to not win an argument with the person at your front door or to prove your favorite point of doctrine or to try to make yourself smarter than other people, read to behold the glory of the Lord. Lord, I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. And then when he does speak to you, here's number two about seeking the Lord and his word. First was read. Second, memorize. Memorize scripture. If you want to behold the glory of the Lord, the word behold is, is the idea of, of gazing, of, of staring at, of, of looking to. It's not a glance. If you want to experience real change, then you need to be, be focused on something. And the way you do that is to memorize. You memorize Scripture. You, you can do it. Now, you might say, well, look, I'm, my brain is just not really good at memorizing. Well, practice. You'll get better. You can memorize and get out a notepad and write down the verse. Write it down 10 times. Put it on a little sticky note. Put it on your on your dashboard of your car, put it on the mirror in your bathroom, put it right next to your bed. God's spoken something to you. You're beholding him. You're thinking of what he said to you. You want to memorize it so you always have it with you. Isn't it great having a smartphone and you can carry it with you because now my calendar's with me and you know my Instagram, I can stalk my kids, find out what they're doing, what they ate, where they're, you know, who they're with or whatever. You know, you... You've got, all these, you got it with you. You can say, man, I can just put it in my pocket. I got it with me. When you memorize something, you've got it with you, right? You've memorized it. It's with you. You can recall it. You've got dead time during your day, and you're like, wait a minute, what was that thing that I read? Oh, yeah, and you memorized it. You can recall it, and you have it again, and you read and you memorize so that you can meditate. Now, this isn't meditation in the worldly sense. Meditation, the way it's practiced in the world, is almost a, an escape of put out everything. Just focus on some thought that just lets you get lost from your pressures. Well, biblical meditation is the exact opposite. You're bringing something in. You're bringing the Word in. You're meditating on the Word. 
So that thing that God spoke into you when you were reading, that then you memorized, now you begin to meditate on it. You start to pray about it. Maybe it is one of those verses I already quoted. Trust the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. And so now you're meditating on it. You start thinking, every time I'm in trouble, I start thinking of all the ways out. I'm always leaning on my own understanding. Meditating is then you say, Lord, help me not do that. Help me not to lean on my understanding, but lean on you. Help me to turn that thing over to you. It becomes a way that you start to commune with God. And in your, in your knowledge of the word of God, you're actually taking that into a relationship with God. You're beholding the glory of the Lord through his word. And then lastly, read, memorize, meditate, and the last would be obey. Do it. Whatever God said, do it. Take it seriously. Beholding his glory. Say, all right, Lord, you've said this. I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm taking it seriously, and I see now how it applies to my life. Lord, I'm going to do it. You'll be, you'll be gazing into his face. That's beholding the Lord. That's seeking the Lord. Behold the glory of the Lord, not just in his word, but also in prayer. And what I want to talk about with prayer is not the basic components of prayer. These are, these are important. Uh, worship or adoration. You know, if you use that acronym of ACTS, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, these are words that describe different aspects of prayer. So when you say, oh, Lord, you're so awesome, you're so wonderful, that's adoration. Lord, I'm so stupid and lame, that's confession. Thanksgiving, thank you, Lord, that I won't always have to be stupid and lame. You know, being thankful, supplication is bringing your requests. A basic acronym to understand the components. So prayer is made up of these different things. Praying for other people, worshiping God, confessing our sins, being thankful, bringing our needs before God. I don't, I don't really want to focus on those. Those are kind of the building blocks. What I would like to suggest as it relates to our passage, what leads to real change is prayer that involves listening to God. I, I, we use the word communion, but communion is such a religious word. And the, the, the concept is to enter into God's presence, not just with a shopping list where you read through it, put it on his desk and say, see you later, I hope you get these done pretty quick. I got things to do. And then you're out. But to boldly approach the throne of grace because the veil has been taken away to, to actually spend some time in fellowship with God. To say, Lord, what, what's on your heart? Lord, I want to bring my marriage before you. Lord, I love my wife, and you're doing a work in us, and we're going through these different things. And, but Lord, what are you saying? What do you want to say to me? And being quiet and listening for his voice. Do you make time in your life to actually have some quiet to hear God speak to you? There's so many, so many uh, things that are drawing for our, you know, vying for our attention, drawing us away from quietness to actually hear God. Prayer that involves listening. A two-way communication. How many of you would love to have a friend who never listened? Oh, someone laughed pretty loud. Someone's like, I got that friend. <laughs> never listened to you at all. You, just, you, know, you get on the phone and you know it's going to be a monologue. And you're like, well, I just wanted to say, and boom, they, they're just back off. And, you know, they, 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 tell, they ask you a question and then they tell you what your answer is. When you pray, don't pray like that. Lord, what's your answer? Lord, what do you want to say to me? I want to hear your voice. Now, normally, the answers are going to come as we're in the Word. We've been praying like this, and these things go together. They're, they're not one or the other. They, they go together. You're praying. You're meditating on the Word. The answer's coming through the thing God's speaking to you. You're meditating on that Scripture. You're talking about it. You're listening from it. And then God's speaking it into your life. But it's all about a personal relationship with God. It's all a way to behold Him. This idea of abiding that is the analogy Jesus used. This is how we bear fruit. This is how the life that's in the vine, because of its nature, comes into a branch that could never bear fruit unless it was connected. So I don't have the ability to have this fruit produced, but I'm connected, and so the life that's in the vine is now flowing in me, and now it's coming out of me. There's real change right there. Now something from outside of me has come into me, and now it's coming through me. That's the only way that I know that there can be real change. And I, I love this verse in particular. It reminds me of my pastor, 
Chuck Smith, the pastor from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, one of his favorite words was the word glory. And many times, if you had talked to him about something that was going on in your life that was really exciting or some victory, his answer to it would be glorious. And, and I would always think when I watch him say that word glory or hear him say glorious, the way he said it was like he knew what glory meant. He knew that word. He knew it by experience. And I was always jealous because I thought, I don't know glory like he knows glory. He's, he's got a relationship with the Lord where, like Paul describes here, we're beholding as in a mirror. What are we beholding? The glory of the Lord. Now, it's interesting about glory is human beings crave glory. Human beings crave glory. The way our culture has gone in the last, let's say, 10 years or so, we, I think we've always been like this, but with the social media the way that it is, it's interesting how that human desire to have glory, uh, you know, just watching some of the ways social media has morphed and, and the most popular sites are even just new ways of, you know, this person's glorious. They're this recording artist or they're this celebrity kind of a personality and everybody wants to know what they're doing. And there are, you know, whole TV shows that are devoted to this person's doing this. They're walking down this street. We got a picture of them. And, you know, the show's on TV. People are, but advertisers are paying lots of money to advertise their product because everybody wants to see who saw that person coming out of that car. Well, there they are. Look, at, it's a real, it's a movie star. I saw him. One of the cool things about traveling, when people find out you're from California, you know the first question you get when you're traveling abroad and they, you're from California? What do they say? You guys know, have you traveled? You know what they say? Have you seen any movie stars? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, California, they're everywhere. I live in Elk Grove. We got them. <laughs> you just go for a walk down Laguna Boulevard. You get Stallone, every, you know, Schwarzenegger. I mean, he's the governor. He's, he's here every day. You see him all the time, man. Movie stars are everywhere. Yeah, I, I've been in like, like kind of remote villages in Eastern Europe. You see movie stars. And you think, what are you talking about? <laughs> you just drove to your house. There was a horse-drawn wagon, you know, with rutabaggers on it going down the road. You know, like, you want to see a movie star. What is that? What is that? The human nature enamored with what? I'd call it glory. It's glory. The beauty the art, the fashion, the design, the creativity, the something that's touching, it's transcending. This person's risen above everybody else. And man, I'd like to see him. I want to touch him. I want to get a picture with him. I want their autograph. I want a selfie. Okay, can I get a selfie with you? Sure. I'm a star. I want to touch some glory. I think it's the, the famous Andy Warhol quote about everybody, you know, their 15 minutes of fame. And that's an old quote. But we're at a stage now where with YouTube, and just, it's just really interesting that, that every, every advancement, or no matter how the cultures change or whatever culture it is in the world, there's, there's a human desire for glory. And I don't think that the desire for glory, there's anything wrong with it. I think God made us to long for glory. The problem is that we're perverted. And so we're, we're, we're offered a cheap substitute by the enemy for the real thing. So the Bible doesn't say, hey, look, just give up your idea for glory. The Bible says, no, no, you want glory. That's what you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Just long for the real thing and, and go for the real thing. Glory, real glory. He says in verse 18, We've got this veil that's taken away. We've got an unveiled face. And so we look, we behold, we gaze as in a mirror upon the glory of the Lord. What is it that we're fixated on? Glory. Real glory. Not a glory that passes away, but a real glory. And in that glorious state that we're gazing, that we're gazing upon, that exchange, that interaction, we're being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. And it's by the Spirit of the Lord. God's transcendent beauty and majesty. God's glory. God's power. If you think about uh, 
the great athletes, you know, I think, you know, we're coming into playoffs, you know, we have the college seasons ending football or coming into the NFL playoffs. And you think about uh, the stars when I was a kid growing up and watching the, the stars from the 70s play. And now the guys are old dudes, you know. Some of them are dead already. You know, the, uh, you know, the things that they did to their bodies to play at that level. Um, I just think of that, that Pittsburgh Steeler team. I think of Mike Webster. Mike Webster died. I think he was like 52 years old. So, I mean, something like a really young guy. Um, but just what an athlete, what a stud. So glorious. I mean, so many championships. But if you try to talk to a young person today and say, oh, you should have seen the old steel curtain. Man, you should have seen Mean Joe Green. And, and a young person, they look at you and like, oh, man, you're living in the past. Right? Young guys? He's like, like come on, old dude. Come on. Don't even, what are you talking about? <laughs> all right old dude yeah sure whatever i know i was a young guy once you look at the old guys you're like yeah okay living in the glory days back in your day oh yeah in your day you had leather helmets no wonder your head looks like that old dude <laughs> you know it's just interesting glory fades doesn't it do you see uh the uh princess leia like Apparently, a bunch of people have been down, like made a bunch of public comments about the actress who plays Princess Leia in the Star Wars that she's, you know, she's old. She's not attractive. Like, you know, people are like, she hasn't aged well. So she came out, you know, Carrie Fisher came out like, you know, hey, old age catches, you know, she kind of wrote back some things in public or whatever. And you think, well, she's old. She's aged. What do you think? She's going to look exactly the same as she did in her 20s, you know, 35 years later? Well, the glory fades, right? It fades. Movie stars from the 20s, they were everything. They were it. But then the 30s came, someone replaced them. Then the 40s came, someone replaced them. Then the 50s came, someone replaced them. The 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Someone's glorious today, guess what? They're not glorious tomorrow. All the things of the world, all the glorious things in the world, it's all only just for a moment. It is that Andy Warhol quote of 15 minutes. You got your 15 minutes of glory, but it's, it's a, there's a start point, there's an end point, and then it's going to be gone. Paul's talking about a glory that transcends. Is God more glorious today than he was in the days of Abraham or the days of Moses? Not less, not more. He just is. When God, when there was nothing and God said, let there be light and there was light and God out of nothing created everything, and revealed his glory in that. That same glory is the same glory today. When God rolls up the present heavens and an earth as a scroll and makes a new heaven and a new earth and his righteousness dwells in it and his glory is manifest in it, it's not any less or any more. He just is. That's real glory. That's the longing that's, that's in our heart to triumph and to rise above and to have something and to grab hold of it. That's what our longing is really for. It's for him. And if we're going for something less than that, we're going to be disappointed. We'll, we'll grab it and it's chasing after the wind. There's nothing there. But God's beauty, you know, when, when God revealed himself to Abram and said, Abram, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram's contemplating God. Or when David's writing a song, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He, he leads me in the green pastures. He restores my soul. And he's, he's writing that song and he's thinking about who God is. When Peter's standing by the shore and Jesus says, hey, let me get in your boat. Let's go out here in the water. And he begins to reveal himself to Peter. You just think of any person who's ever met God, guess what? They met the same God. Not any less, not any more. When you pray, you say, Lord, I want to know you. And you open your Bible and you start to dig in. You say, Lord, let me behold your glory. I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to seek your face. Guess what? It's the same. Not diminished. Not greater. Not less. He just is. He transcends. Majesty, glory, beauty. So Paul says, listen, this veil's taken away. And now we behold this glory of the Lord. And so we're transformed. You want to know how real transformation takes place and real change? This is it. Having a relationship with God, you'll change. It's that simple. Isn't that awesome? Now, if you come to me and say, hey, you know, I noticed you, you lost some weight, Rich. How'd you do it? I would say, well, you got to go to Kyrgyzstan, eat this funky food, and it has a bacteria in it. 
<laughs> it's a jump start on your weight loss program. I'm telling you, it'll hit you good. It, you'll be, you know, releasing any toxins that are in your body. You'll be, you know, you'll, you'll just be um, cleansing and, uh, and then, you know, then, it, you know, your appetite will change. It's just a, you know, it's just a great, uh, and they say, well, I, I don't really want that method. I would say, well, I, you know, I don't have another one. That's the, that's the method. That's a, and it's effective, I can tell you. Or you might, you know, I want to make this change. I want to have this happen. Listen, here's what the Bible says. You want to be transformed? Then behold the glory of the Lord. It will transform you. If you're not being transformed, then ask yourself the question, are you beholding the glory of the Lord? Are you not seeing the changes in your life? Are you not seeing the transformation? Well, here, here is what the Bible's given you, the tools. He's, God's told you the way. He's told you how. We're transformed into the same image from glory to glory. It'll be from one glory to the next glory to the next glory. It won't just be one change, one step, just from here all the way to infinity. It's going to be from glory to glory to glory, to glory, to glory. Ultimately, into his image. And he says, this will be by the Spirit of the Lord. The changes that, that, will make, that God will make in your life will be spiritual, and so they'll be lasting. A real change made by the Spirit of God in you as you behold the glory of the Lord. That's way better than a New Year's resolution. <laughs> The Bible promises transformation by the Spirit. It's a bunch of verses that talk about this. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you know this one by heart. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. God will create something brand new in you so that what you were in your first birth, you were this and that and this and that. Then in Christ now, it's a transformation. You're a new creation. Old things pass away. New things come into your life. So when you're, a, when you're a Christian and you're beholding the glory of the Lord and there's an area in your life that's just a deficit, you, you know, the, the opportunity or the need is, is revealed and you just say, I've never been able to do this. I've never, ever done this the right way. I don't even think it's in me to be able to do this the right way. But then you're a new creation in Christ. Transformation comes as you behold the glory of the Lord. The circumstances are revealing it. God's word's shown you what God wants to do. The Spirit of God now works a change in you, and you're a new creation in Christ. Something new comes into your life. I remember being um, engaged to my wife, and when uh, we were about four months away from getting married, um, maybe five months, we were looking for our, our wedding uh, location where our church was under construction, the church we were attending, and, and they had to put a circus tent up in the parking lot, and Gina didn't want to get married in a circus tent, and uh, I didn't understand why. It's like, you know, whatever. But uh, so we were looking around, and she found this venue, and I hadn't seen it, and he started having this, I go, I really want to see it, even though I, for whatever reason, I didn't really even care, but for some reason, I was just, I want to see it, and you know, and and then she just tapped into something. She said, well, you don't trust me. I said, well, I trust you. No, you don't trust me. And we started to bicker. Yes, yes, you don't. No, yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. And then all of a sudden, I just had this revelation in that moment of, actually, I don't trust her. And I, and I just thought back in my whole life, at, at a very early age, I decided that I wasn't going to trust anybody. I'm from probably like about nine years old, I just decided, I'm done. I'm just going to build the walls, and I'm just going to handle it, and no one's getting back in. And now here I am about to pledge allegiance to the bride and make vows that we're going to become one, and I, I've got something in my life that's just not there. I mean, how do you enter into a marriage relationship where you won't trust somebody? Well, you can. I mean, you could get married, but it's not going to be pleasant. We have all these secret, you know, booby traps and walls and false walls and, and you know, no, how are you going to have intimacy when you won't let anybody in? 
But I'm a Christian, you see. God got a hold of my life. And God let my circumstances come to a point where it's revealing this deficit. But God's not judging me in my deficit. He's only revealing it so that he can say, look it, you don't have any of this stuff, and this stuff's necessary to go forward. That's not a place of hopelessness for the believer. That's a place of miracle. That's a place for glory. That's a place where God's now putting his finger on something, and you say, all right, I've never trusted any, I haven't trusted anybody in a long time, ever. Lord, change me. And guess what? As by the Spirit of God, all of a sudden, I barely trust her. <laughs> a little sprout comes out of the ground. A little, a little plant now of trust is starting to grow. I mean, it doesn't, it's not like all of a sudden, boom, you've got the victory. It's now, but you know what? That thing was not there. There was nothing there. There wasn't, there wasn't any hope that this thing was going to work. It's like, you bet I don't trust you because you could ruin my life, and you're about to choose a stupid wedding place that's going to ruin my life. I don't want it. And we could just start fighting. I could keep the walls up, right? That would be natural. But if you're beholding the glory of the Lord, transformation comes into your life by the Spirit of God. I can't look at the things that God's done in my life and say, you guys should just be more like me because I make these great decisions. I could just say, I'm a stupid idiot. <laughs> I can't believe that God's been able to do anything in my life. The only way I know any change ever happened in my life is I would just keep beholding the glory of the Lord. That's the only thing that I know. I just keep seeking him. And he keeps revealing himself to me. And then by the Spirit of God, he changes. That's, that's how God transforms us. And when he does it, we could tell somebody else, God could do that in your life, in this area, because he's done that for me, and there was nothing there, and I, I could see that you're coming to the end of yourself, but be of good cheer at the end of yourself. That's where you'll, you'll see the power of God now. He's going to do something. Now, God, now you need a miracle. Now God can make something out of nothing. He's predestined us. Romans 8, 29, Those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. This is something God's already determined. You're going to be like Jesus. <laughs> He's going to transform you. It's, it's already decided. It's, it's a victory that's been won. It's not like some of us become like Jesus and then some of us stay lame and some of us are really lame and people that are really lame have seats way in the back in heaven, maybe on another continent in heaven, like the, like the ragtag believers who got saved there on a, like Australia, like a penal colony. And then the real Christians are over here. No, no. You've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You're going to be changed from glory to glory. It's going to happen. How awesome is that? So don't be conformed to this world. You know this verse by heart, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind can be renewed. How is your mind renewed? We already talked about it, by seeking the Lord in his word and in prayer, meditating on the word of God, in fellowship with God. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but let your mind be changed. In Romans 13, verse 14, Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a way to describe the Christian life. Put on Jesus. Just climb into Jesus. Just put on Jesus. In Galatians 6, 15, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Christianity is not about an outward ritual, whether you participated in it or didn't participate. It's not circumcision or uncircumcision, but it's a new creation. That's what matters. We think, well, I can't do anything to make a new creation. Exactly. What do you do? You just seek the Lord. You seek the Lord, you behold the glory of the Lord, and then you'll be transformed. It's a byproduct of seeking Him. Put on the new man, he says in Colossians 3.10. Put on Christ, he had already said. Put on the new man who is renewed in, the, in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. This is all the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's able to wash us, to regenerate us, to make us brand new in Christ. So when it comes to getting real change, if you want real change, number one, you've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There won't ever be any real change without that. 
Now, you might be able to work harder at something. You might be able to attain to something, but it will, it will, if it lasts, it won't last very long. You might get your 15 minutes of fame. You might, might make it to the top of the, of the king of the mountain pile and be up there for a moment, but someone will pull you off of it. Your career will be over. You'll be passed on, and, and you know, someone else will climb to the top. You might get your moment in the glory, but it will be a glory that doesn't last. It's not the real glory that you're, that you're longing for. If you want real change and you want to experience glory, you've got to accept Jesus Christ. He's the way out. He's the escape from this world's quicksand. It's sinking in on itself. You open your heart to him and you ask him to come in and he'll come in. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. You think of the God of the world standing at your door saying, will you let me come in? I know you're craving glory. Well, it's my glory that you're craving. Just let me come in. I know you're wanting real change. That's why you're making, you're, you see it. You want it. Will you open your heart and let me come in? That's the starting point. And if you've already done that, then as Paul puts it here in verse 18, we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what are we doing as Christians? (laughs) We're beholding the glory of the Lord. Our church services should be about Beholding the glory of the Lord. We're not, we're not, a, we're not gathering together as believers to, to watch other people do something and then spectate. We're actively participating ourselves individually and then thus corporately in seeking the Lord together as part of the body of Christ. We're not the whole body of Christ. We're just a small part of it. There's churches all across our community gathering to do the same thing, all across the country, all across the world. Believers in Jesus Christ gathering together on a regular basis, doing what? Beholding the glory of the Lord. Hopefully, I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And why would we do that? Because we're created for glory. The result of doing that is you're changed. You're changed. So don't let guilt or shame hinder you from going forward. <clears throat> Realize that the veil is taken away. Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for sin. You could be free from sin. You can have a relationship with God. But you open your heart to the Lord, and then you seek the Lord. And then the real changes will come. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you make it plain and simple. And We thank you, Lord, that in you there's forgiveness and I know, Lord, as we come to the end of a year, so many make assessments. We look at our lives and we count up uh, the mistakes that we've made or the challenges or you know, just the difficulties. And we, we're always, if we look at things and we're honest, we're going to come up with, with guilt and shame. And we just thank you, Lord, that you came into this world to save sinners. You didn't come to call the, the healthy, but you came to call the sick. And it's not those who are righteous, but those who are sinners that you came for. And so thank you for that, Lord, that you came for us. And thank you, Lord, that your blood is enough to take away the penalty for sin. And we want to walk in that grace, Lord. And we just thank you for the simplicity of your word and Paul writing about this transformation that takes place as we behold your glory. And so, Lord, we all need it. We all need to keep being transformed. You've already done things maybe in our lives, and so we've had glory, but we know, Lord, you want to do more. And so it's from glory to glory. So help us, Lord. We, we pray that we would behold your glory. Pray for each person listening that if there's some that are on the sidelines, they're on the fence, maybe they've believed about you, they've known about you, and they've believed about you, but they've never really truly entered into a personal relationship with you where they've really sought you with their whole heart. Lord, I pray that you'd, you'd call them. They'd, they'd enter into that, Lord, and they would, they would pursue you. Lord, thank you for the glory that's ours and for the transforming power of the Spirit that, that you have given as a free gift 
Lord, do a work in our lives. Reveal yourself. Thank you for this new covenant and that the veil is taken away. So, Lord, help us, we pray. Help us to be all about Jesus. We, we ask these things in his name. Amen.